I started uh, preaching on the theme of prayers uh, yesterday, and uh, let us uh, continue with it. I'm preaching from the passage in the book of James, chapter 5, uh, and beginning uh, from, thir- from verse number 13. So we are talking about how to pray effectively and productively. So here, the Apostle of God, James tells us, verse number 13, Is any among you afflicted? Let him or her pray. Again, it opens very well that if you have any affliction, any trial, any hardship, any difficult of any kind, he simply says, let him pray. If you're afflicted, if you're struggling, the Bible commands you to do what? Pray. Uh, so I want to know that you are, you are with me. So the Bible wants you to do what? Pray. Uh, let's say that again. Pray. pray. Let's say that again. Pray. I, I like to, to ensure that these preaching, these words are getting into our hearts and in our spirits. That if is anyone among you afflict, afflicted, let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. In other words, has God answered your prayers? Are things going well in your life during this season? Then you praise the Lord. You sing songs to the Lord. Then he says, verse number 14. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. Elders of the church means pastors of the church, servants of God. In the church, church leaders. And let them pray over him. Let them pray over him. The second word, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Now, you, 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 you notice James is emphasizing that when the pastors anoint the sick with oil, they must do that in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is not the oil that heals the person. It is the power of the Lord Jesus Christ that heals. When we, as pastors, anoint the sick... We are invoking the anointing of God that is within the name of Jesus Christ. And, and, and I thought I should explain that uh, because some people who are new to a spirit-filled church, they may wonder why is it that when we are praying for the sick, we anoint them with oil. It is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. It is an indication that we are invoking a divine anointing to come upon that person, not in the name of Dr. John Joroge, but in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 15. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. And the prayer of faith, and he's used to the word here translated shall, but it's the same, we can use the same, the same word as will. And the prayer of faith will save or heal the sick. Now, you understand the Apostle James is very particular. He is not say, he's not just saying that a prayer of doubt or a wavering prayer or a prayer of unbelief. He's very particular in this passage that if we want the sick to be healed, we must pray with what kind of prayer? Prayer of faith. And the prayer of faith will save the sick or heal the sick. And the Lord 
shall raise him up. And if he hath committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. And this is the power of prayer. You know, sometimes some conditions in our physical bodies are caused by our errors in judgment. Sometimes they are caused by our sins. Sometimes they are caused by our bad choices. But God is telling us that if there is so much power in the prayer that when we lay our hands with anointing and pray for the sick, not only that God will heal them, he says, if they have committed sin, and if the reason that brought out that condition is because of something they had done in their lives, it is a double portion. You get healed, and then you get what? You get forgiven of that sin that you committed or that error that you made that created the condition that brought you to that situation of sickness. Meaning that because with this double miracle from God, that is healing and forgiveness of sins, it means when God heals you, he will heal you completely so that any other effect of that sin will not bring that disease back. That is the reason you are both healed and forgiven, meaning the forgiveness is to remove the root cause of that disease. That whatever caused those symptoms to come to start with, when we pray for you a prayer of faith and we anoint you in the name of Jesus Christ, Guess what will happen? The actual manifestation of the disease is taken away, is healed. And the root cause of that disease is also healed. So that it will not come back. How many of you know, believe when God heals you, he heals you 100%? Hallelujah. He heals you 100%. Then verse 10 says, confess your thoughts one to another and pray for one another. Uh, now, when James admonishes us to confess our thoughts one to one another, this is a tough one to be able to, to, to explain. There are some churches, and I know uh, in Africa, where they read this, and uh, they would encourage people to come in front of the church and if they have sinned, to confess their sins in front of the whole congregation. And this really became very problematic because sometimes uh, if a person stole something from a church member and they come in front to confess it, it did not end up very well. And instead of getting forgiveness, they end up getting a beating. But, but James is not saying, stand in front of the church and confess your sins, what you have done. It is saying, if you have wronged a person or a person have wronged you, you can approach them and privately talk with them and confess your sins and ask for forgiveness. But the more powerful thing he, say, he says is, and pray for one another. But basically, the same passage we've been talking about it is giving us two types of prayers that are still powerful to bring healing to a sick person. The first one is the elders and the pastors anointing the sick with oil and praying over them and God heals them. The second one is for believers themselves to pray for one another. And the Bible says if as believers we pray for one another, with a prayer of faith, that God will heal you. In other words, your hands, you as a believer, you have God's anointing in you. If you have a good relationship with God Almighty, you've been filled with the Holy Spirit, you have an anointing in you, and you can pray for one another, and you and the sick can be healed. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. 
So pray for one another. And, and, and actually, uh, we do that in this church. Uh, usually during these 21 days of, of, of revival, sometimes, at, um, and I don't know whether we are doing that this year, or, or Pastor Barry Cabasson, uh, people come early and they will pray for one another. Uh, you, you know, ahead you know, of the service, it is practicing this whole notion of praying you know, for one another. Uh, the church used to have you know, Bible studies, uh, home-based, and in those home-based Bible studies, people would be taught the word and pray for one another, praying for one another. Now, all this, what he's leading to from verse number 13 and going to verse number 16, he's trying to hit home a very powerful message of faith regarding our prayers. So he says, so pray for one another that you may be healed. Then he says, why? Because the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Because the effectual fervent, meaning persistent, earnest, prayers of a righteous person availeth much. So he tells us in verse 17, Elijah was a man subject to like passions like us, as we are, and he prayed honestly. How did he pray? Honestly, effectively, fervently, that it, may, that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. Verse 18. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. So, I wanna, let, me, let me ask you all over the house of the Lord to stand up on your feet for a moment. I, I, I like to let us stand up and, and, and make uh, some declarations as we continue in the word. Hallelujah. The Bible says... You can have what you decree if it lines up with the word of God. And it, it tells us very clearly that when we, decree, when we decree a thing that lines up in his promises, he will do it. Uh, let us decree uh, together. Say, I decree today in the name of Jesus that I am highly favored. Do you believe that? Hallelujah. I decree today that I will walk in God's providential care in 2024. You know, that means that you will lack nothing, that you will fear nothing, that through that this year, you are, you are declaring in the name of Jesus that God's providence in every area of your life will come your way. Will come your way. Will come your way. Hallelujah. Say, I declare that this year I will run and not walk. So, in other words, God will put some spring in your feet. In whatever you are doing, instead of walking slowly, God is going to make you run towards your destiny, towards your provision, towards the answers to your prayers. Isn't that a good thing? That everything that you've been waiting for, everybody say, no more delay. It is coming now. You, you've been waiting for a long time for that prayer, for that provision you've been believing God for. So we are declaring today, in the name of Jesus, <laughs> that is coming. 
No more delay, no more delay. Lord, we want to walk in it. No more delay. No more delay. Hallelujah, hallelujah. That this is the time, this is the season to receive those answers to those prayers. Hallelujah, hallelujah. The Bible says in Luke chapter 1 verse 37, For with God nothing shall be impossible. I do not care whether there is an available solution for the miracle you've been praying for. I'm here to tell you that our God is not like any other God. Our God is the only genuine mighty God or God who created us and created the universe. Meaning that if there is no existing solution for that problem, God who created the solution for you. Hallelujah. God who created the solution for you because he is almighty and nothing shall be impossible with him. You may, you may be seated. Hallelujah, hallelujah. So, let's continue with our conversation regarding how to pray an effectual, effective and a productive prayer. And the last thing we were uh, talking about uh, yesterday was that we are engaged in a spiritual warfare. And we read Ephesians chapter 10 that it says, that verse 12 that says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And then he tells us to put on certain weapons of our warfare. And one of the most weapons of our warfare that is listed here in Ephesians chapter 10, verse number 18, is the weapon of prayers. Did you know that the prayers is one of the most powerful weapons against the forces of darkness? Yes. Verse 18 says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. What, I, what I'm doing uh, these uh, th three days, it is to encourage the church to inspire. You see, when, uh, when you preach, either you can, do, you can teach uh, or you can preach. Uh, teaching produces knowledge. Knowledge is very important because it can help you solve you know, problems. Uh, i got to tell you, church, Dr. Barry Kerberson is one of the best teachers about prayers and fasting. In fact, I think, uh, I think Pastor Barry, you, you did your research for your dissertation in the area of prayers and fasting. Is that correct? You, you think about a person who wrote their doctoral dissertation in the area of prayers and fasting. So, so I thought I will not attempt to teach about prayers and fasting because we have the best teacher of that topic in this church. Come on, let's appreciate the pastor. This is, amen. And, and I'm not just saying this to flatter him. This is the truth. He studied and wrote, <laughs> and wrote his dissertation about it. So what I'm doing, I'm preaching about prayers. Preaching has a different purpose. Preaching aims at producing conviction. Conviction produces action. So not just the knowledge, so I'm taking a different, and, and, and the reason I know this difference, because I don't know whether most of you know, I am a professor. I'm not just a professor, I am a tenured, full professor. <laughs> I'm not just saying that to toot to, to, to my horn, is that how Americans say it? Tooting my horn? Uh, so I'm not just saying to toot my horn, is that I had to go through a lot. Uh, I was hired as an assistant professor, then I had to work really hard in, in producing in all areas of evaluation. Uh, then after five years, then you, 
you have to be evaluated, you go through a very difficult process to apply for promotion to associate professor, then you apply for tenure, and, and the tenure, we, we still have tenure in, in American colleges and universities uh, in the teaching profession, uh, and tenure is really good. <laughs> Somebody said yes. There is somebody here who works in the school system. You, you know, tenure is wonderful. Although these days they are trying to take it away, they figure that once you get tenure, you, you no longer produce. You, you relax. Um, so, yeah, so, so I received my tenure. So I am tenure. Now, tenure is good because it means a, even if you hit 70 or 75 or whatever, they don't force you to retire. You have a job. Yeah, of course, some people do need to retire. <laughs> uh, in other words, you keep on working until you feel like uh, either you are held or you are not able uh, to produce uh, the way you need to produce. Uh, so as a professor, when I go to the classroom to lecture, I teach. I do not preach. However, because I have very unique careers, one, I'm a college professor, and I'm also the chairman of the Department of History and Political Science. So I supervise men and women with PhDs. And let me tell you, those are very difficult people to supervise. Because <laughs> every PhD thinks they know it all. <laughs> so, um, and, and, and so, you know, so I'm a professor and, and I'm also a preacher. And so most of the times I'm preaching on Sunday somewhere. And then on Monday, I go to class. And I have to remove the, the preaching hat and put on the professor's hat. It's not easy. Because I find myself, sometimes um, I start my lecture, I'm, lecture, I'm lecturing about... A American Constitution, and you know, I'm talking about a particular aspect of the Constitution. Then I look at my students and I say to them, Amen. <laughs> <laughs> I completely forget I'm in the classroom and I'm remembering I'm in the church, like I was preaching yesterday. <laughs> yeah, luckily, at least in South Georgia, they are okay. Once in a while, I'll have a few students say, Amen. <laughs> so, <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, that I was making a point that what I'm doing these three days is to preach about to prayers, to encourage you, to inspire you, to give you more boldness and courage, and above all, to raise your level of faith as you pray. Because the Bible says faith comes by hearing, and by hearing the word of God. And I really believe, as an educator, that repetition is good. Because the more you hear a thing, and you hear it again and again and again, the more faith you get in it. So the more we preach and encourage you about prayers, the more the faith of God will grow in you to receive a miracle, to receive answers for your prayers. So I just wanted everyone in the church to know what Dr. Joe is doing this week. I'm building your faith. I'm inspiring you. Amen? I'm starting you up towards prayers. And the other preachers that will come, I encourage you, if you are able to get time off from work, I understand sometimes in the evening, there are people who work in the evening. Uh, when I lived in Tennessee, I attended this revival meeting all 21 days without missing any. And I'm telling you, by the end of those 21 days of praying and fasting, my whole life is changed for that year. I, I, when you finish the 21 days, you have very new energy, spiritual energy, to face the next 12 months. And I'm telling you, it is going to change you this year. Try to come every night, no matter who is preaching. Do not worry about the person. Do not worry about the messenger. I want you to care for the word that they are bringing. You see, a preacher is a vehicle that the Holy Spirit uses to convey the message from heaven. And as you sit there, God has a special message for you. He may use different preachers in different ways, but God will make sure he gets that message to you. 
Amen? So please, you know, go beyond the person. Go beyond their accent. <laughs> Amen? Go beyond their vocabulary and try to focus on the message, on the word of the Lord. Because everyone that God spoke to Pastor Barry Capperson to invite this year to come and preach is because there is a divine purpose for the, for the message God has given them. And it's your message. So please attend the meetings every night. So, prayers is a weapon of our warfare. It is one of the weapons in our quiver against the powers of darkness, against the trials of life. Second Corinthians chapter 6, verse 3 through 5, the Bible says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. Verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God, to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. I'm telling you, prayers is a powerful weapon against the forces of the enemy that we face. In Isaiah chapter 54, verse 17, the Bible says, No weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue that shall rise against you in judgment, thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, says the Lord. So when you employ the weapon of prayer constantly, you are raising up those weapons to protect you and your family so that any weapon the devil has raised against you, it shall not prosper. And whether at work, in your businesses, wherever you are, any tongue that rises up against you, or backbites against you, or try to undermine your position, God will rebuke it. Amen? Come on, somebody should have said amen there. Amen. You, you know, uh, I'm a political scientist. I, there, there, I know there is politics everywhere, and especially in the office at work, there's a lot of politics. And there are some people who just be jealous of you because you are doing well or because you are succeeding. And anyone who rises against you because they are jealous of you, I rebuke them in Jesus' name. So that in that position God has given you, in that place of work, you will prosper and continue to grow and increase for the glory of God. No weapon formed against you shall prosper because of prayers. Second Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9, the Bible says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro, and fro, throughout the earth, to show himself strong in behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. In Isaiah chapter 59, verse 19, the Bible says, So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising sun when the enemy shall come in like a flood the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a stand against him. As you prevail in prayers, as you prevail in prayers, the Spirit of the Lord shall fight on your behalf and he shall raise up a standard against the enemy on your behalf. And, 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 and he's saying, wherever the enemy comes from, whether from the east, from the west, from the south from the north, the Spirit of the Lord will protect you. That's what it means to be a believer. Christians, as I said, 
we are engaged in this warfare, but we have weapons to win it. This is why the Apostle John tells us that the kingdom of God suffers violence and the violent take it by force. It means Satan and his forces are trying to undermine you and to take away God's kingdom from your life. But you know what? You have the fire of God in you through prayers and you have the supernatural force of God in you that you will not only defeat the enemy, but you will be able to get more of God's kingdom away from the enemy. Now, the word of God does not lose power. And we are hearing from the word of God that our prayers are effective. If we pray effectively, honestly, we will receive reward. We will have our answers. The word of God is a true promise. The word of God does not lose its power because it, is, it doesn't look power no matter who, is going, uh, who are the earthly vessels that convey it because the word of God is backed by God himself. Hallelujah. It doesn't matter what country you come from, if you're preaching the word of God, I'm not here to back the word of God. God is here to back his word. The vehicle, the earthly vehicle that conveys the word is simply used to convey a supernatural message. The message we, we preach is relevant because we are preaching it from God. So the God whom we confront in the scriptures is a miracle-working God. It is his nature to do wondrous things in his mercy and in his judgment. The God of the Bible is a creator. He can, he can reach, he can create a miracle just for me and for you to provide a solution for a situation that is unique and that you and I are facing. So I want to just uh, talk a, 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 a little bit about what prayers will do, and I'll cover just a few items and we'll continue uh, tomorrow, what these effective prayers, persistent prayers, what it, will, what it will do. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And church, I pray right now that the power of God Almighty will reach out to somebody in this church during this revival, locate you wherever you are, and give you a miracle that you need. Because that miracle is available for you. And you will get it this year. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Do you receive that? <laughs> hallelujah. So, prayers are powerful because they can change the destiny of an individual, the destiny of a family, or even the destiny of a country. And I, I want to finish with this passage and then I'll, I'll continue tomorrow. In the, in the book of Isaiah, we are told the story of Hezekiah. Isaiah chapter 38, verse 1 through 8. That in those days, Hezekiah became sick and was at the point of death. And Isaiah, the prophet, the son of Amos, came to him and said to him, Thus says the Lord, set your house in order, for you shall die. You shall not recover. Can you imagine hearing such bad news that you shall die and you shall not recover? And this is coming from a prophet of God because his time had come to an end or uh, at least his assignment uh, here on earth had come to an end. And so <clears throat> he's told, you are going to die. And you know, God's prophet could not be wrong. His days had come to an end. Then, verse 2, then Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord. Hallelujah. Now, I want the church to listen to me here as we conclude. 
here the prophet of God brings a message of God and tells Hezekiah, go prepare because you are going to die. You are not going to recover from this sickness. Um, and uh, instead of Hezekiah complaining and, and feeling sorry for himself and just preparing to die, uh, Hezekiah deci decided, I'm not, going, I'm not going to accept this. He decided to turn before God and he started praying. Now, let, 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 me, let, me, let me ask you. If, if you knew for sure you are going to die, and, and, and you don't want to die, can you imagine the type of prayer you would pray to stop the death from taking you? Do you know the seriousness of prayer? The earnestness? Do you know that the approach of our prayers sometimes is affected by the weight of the matter? How serious the condition is? How serious the situation is. When Hezekiah turned to pray, he prayed with agony, with serious faith, with earnestness, with effectiveness. And he prayed that God may extend his life. Now, think about this. God had already decided Hezekiah's life is coming to an end. And let me ask you, church, do you think you can pray until God changes the intentions that he has about doing something? In other words, you can move God through your prayers for him to change his mind about what he was intending to do. I'm telling you, the testimony from Hezekiah confirms that our prayers, depending on how we are praying, how effective and honest and how serious and the faith behind the prayer and the persistence of that prayer, you can actually move God to change what he, has, he had intended to do. You know the will of God is perfect and he has his reasons why he does things. But it, we, we can see from the Bible that your prayers can move God to change his mind about what he was planning to do. And he can intervene in your behalf. So, so, God spoke to Isaiah, the prophet. Now, at first time God spoke to Isaiah, told him, God tell Hezekiah, he's going to die. And he's going to recover. And the man got on his knees. And he sought the face of God. And he prayed, asking God to extend his life. Now God comes and he speaks to his prophet Isaiah again. And he sends Isaiah to go and speak to Hezekiah. God spoke to Isaiah before he could leave the court of the king and gave him a word for Hezekiah. Isaiah told Hezekiah that the Lord had heard his prayers. And had seen his tears. And God had decided to extend his life by 15 years. Come on, you didn't hear that. Hello? God did what? He heard his prayers and he saw the seriousness, the earnestness of his prayers. And God changed his mind. Ah, church. Somebody should say, hallelujah. God changed his mind because he was moved by a man who cried and cried and wept with seriousness. A man who refused to die. God says, it's your time to die. The man says, no God, please. I refuse to die. I want to live and declare the glory of God to the nations. And God had his prayers. God said, because you wept and prayed by faith, I have decided you are not going to die. I'm going to give you another 15 years. I, I, I wish maybe, maybe Hezekiah should have prayed for another 50. <laughs> Instead of just 15. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Shall we stand up or, uh, please before the Lord?
So I, I do not know uh, what news you may have received during 2023, situation, circumstances you may have faced, but I'm here to tell you, church, that a prayer of faith, that effective, effectual, honest, serious prayer of faith can change your destiny. Even if God had decided that he's going to move you in one direction, but prayer of faith, honest prayer, like Hezekiah prayed, could cause God to move on you and say, yes, yes, you know, maybe your assignment I had given you may have come to an end, but because you prayed, I'm giving you another 15 years. I'm giving you another 20 years here on earth. And I am your God. I will create a new assignment for you to do now. He can do that for you. If he did it for Hezekiah, he will do it for you. He will do it for me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.